News of the Times, Murderous Mondays, The Pynchon Street Torso Mystery. Welcome to News of the Times and this week's episode of Murderous Mondays. In today's episode, it is the 11th of September 1889 and news around the world reverberates with the headlines of Jack the Ripper claiming his ninth victim. Pynchon Street, just around the corner from Berner Street, where Elizabeth Stride was killed, is the scene where a bloody torso is found. The event also happens on the first year anniversary of the murder of Annie Chapman. In today's episode, we look at the details, the crime and the suspects, if any. We hope you enjoy the show. In the early morning hours of Wednesday, September the 10th, 1889, a chilling discovery sent shockwaves through the streets of Whitechapel. At approximately 5.15am, Police Constable William Pennett stumbled upon a gruesome sight under a desolate railway arch on Pynchon Street. There lying lifeless, was the headless and legless torso of an unidentified woman. The body, in an advanced state of decomposition, presented a harrowing scene for the authorities. It was shrouded by a worn chemise, measuring 37 inches in length. The garment made from common material, bore the unmistakable marks of amateur craftsmanship. Clearly, it was the handiwork of someone unskilled in the art of needlework, likely fashioned by an individual of limited means. P.C. Pennett called for reinforcements. Inspector Charles Pinhorn from the H Division swiftly arrived at the scene shortly after 5.30 a.m. to find two constables already present, their faces etched with a mixture of disbelief and concern. The weight of the situation hung heavily in the damp morning air as the investigators began to piece together the fragments of this gruesome puzzle. In the heart of Whitechapel, a neighbourhood already plagued by poverty and despair, the discovery of such a brutalised corpse only deepened the collective unease. Rumours and whispers of a serial killer prowling the fog-laden streets had already taken root in the minds of the local residents. Now, with this horrific find, the fears of an unknown and merciless predator seemed tragically justified. From the Berry Free Press, the 14th of September, 1889, another Whitechapel atrocity, Pynchon Street. Whitechapel again has become the telegraphic code signal of the Metropolitan Police and now only needs to be sounded to bring to bear on Whitechapel the scrutiny of the whole force. Yet in spite of the most elaborate system, the most careful organisation and the most rigorous surveillance, another of those terrible crimes which have shocked the whole country has been coolly perpetrated, almost within a stone's throw of the city boundary. The scene of the latest Whitechapel murder is within five minutes' walk of the tower and quite close to Lehman Street Police Station. The body was found under one of the arches of the East London Railway, which runs from Fenchurch Street to the docks. Pynchon Street is a narrow street, with the railway arches on one side and a few cottages the other. It leads out of Backchurch Lane, which is reached either from Whitechapel High Street or from Cable Street, a narrow but busy thoroughfare leading east from the Minories. 
The whole locality is full of wretched slums, and just the place it might be assumed a murderer would select for his horrible work. Important details. Murder sits enthroned, says later report, again at Whitechapel, and on Tuesday morning the whole of the East End was panic-stricken by another startling crime. A woman, as in the numerous previous cases, was the victim. A reporter was early on the spot and got some important details despite the reticence of the police. At twenty minutes past five, the body, bereft of legs and head, was found by a policeman, concealed in a sack in the railway arches at Pynchon Street, Backchurch Lane. Appearances justify the assumption that the murder had recently been committed, though it appears not improbable that the fiendish act was perpetrated at another scene and the trunk carried to Pynchon Street for disposal. Only the body and arms were there. The legs and head were gone. It was consequently impossible to judge the age of the victim. The head was severed close to the shoulder, and the legs were cut off right up to the body. The scene of the discovery is close to the spots where the previous murder was committed which have made Whitechapel hideous. Backchurch Lane turns to the right out of Commercial Road, and at the end the railway crosses it. The arches, with one exception, have gates and are used, as is commonly the case, for stabling and storage. It was in the solitary arch without a door that the body was found wrapped in a sack. There was no blood-saturated ground or any mark of struggling. A few stray pieces of straw, a scrap of waste paper whirled in by the wind. This was all. On the other side of the railway line were other high, dark, damp, vaulted, unused arches, but they seemed to give no clue. A panic again seems to have stricken the whole neighbourhood. In the early morning, excited women and curious men gathered in small knots, discussing the latest tragedy, by far the worst of any of the terrible series. At St. George's Mortuary, morbid curiosity drew a crowd of slatternly young women, eager, if possible, to catch a glimpse of the ghastly body. The police would admit having no clue, and they have refused all information. The papers screamed the news of a ninth victim as memories of the Ripper slayings swept back in gruesome detail. From the Berry Free Press, the 14th of September, 1889, Whitechapel Horrors. The List. First, Commercial Street, April the 3rd, 1888. The Second, George Yard, August the 7th. The Third, Bucks Row, August the 31st, the 4th, Hanbury Street, September the 8th, the 5th, Burner Street, September the 30th, 6th, Mitre Square, September the 30th, the 7th, Dorset Street, November the 9th, 1888, the 8th, Castle Alley, July the 16th, 1889, and the 9th, Backchurch Lane, September the 10th, 1889. The victim, although the torso is without head or legs and was for the most part naked, most information could still be gleaned by the now all too familiar coroner. From the Berry Free Press, the 14th of September 1889, another Whitechapel atrocity. Shortly before six o'clock on Tuesday morning, Scotland Yard received this message, Whitechapel again, 
and in the space of a few minutes, they were able to telegraph all over the Metropolitan Police District the following message. At 8.40 a.m., trunk of woman found under the arches in Pynchon Street. Age, about 40. Height, 5 foot 3 inches. Hair, dark brown. No clothing except a chemise very much torn and blood-stained. Both elbows discoloured as if from habitual leaning on them, post-mortem marks around the waist apparently caused by a rope. After the removal of the remains to the mortuary, Mr. Clark made a brief medical examination of them. From this was seen that both legs had been skilfully separated from the body and that the head was missing. There was a long rip in the abdomen extending from inside the left thigh up to the breastbone. None of the abdominal organs were missing. There was a gap about four inches wide in the stomach through which the intestines could be distinctly seen. The trunk exhibited signs of decomposition, and in the opinion of the medical man, death had taken place some four days previously. It was noticed that the trunk displayed green patches. The flesh otherwise was white. The doctors, from their investigations, concluded that the cuts had been inflicted in a left-hand manner. That is to say, the cut of the throat was evidently commenced on the left side and carried to the right with one clean sweep. The same peculiarity was observed in the other wounds, and in separating the legs more flesh had been cut from the trunk on the left side than on the other. In more than one of the previous crimes, this peculiarity had been observed and commented upon. The legs were taken out cleanly from the groin, the sockets of the joints showing no sign of separating instrument. Nothing whatever was found to be missing except these members and the head. The cut severing the head from the body was skilfully done, no hacking or clumsy dissection noticeable. Furthermore, a saw had been used to sever the bones in such a way as to leave little doubt that the person responsible for the dismemberment possessed a good knowledge of anatomy. There were no signs about the hands which would indicate that the woman had been used to hard work, and so, far as could be seen, there had been no attempt to obliterate a mark on one of the fingers apparently caused by a ring. It is believed from certain indications that the deceased had never been a mother, but she might have been pregnant. The body was well nourished and cared for. One of the several doctors who viewed the remains expressed the opinion that, had he been asked to dissect the body in the manner in which he saw it, he could not have done it more neatly and skilfully. The general panic that ensued in Whitechapel cannot be overstated. Police were intensely scrutinised. The question arose, was the torso found a new, more horrific step in the Ripper slayings? Or was this killing part of the series of the Thames torso mysteries which we have covered in a previous episode? Government officials keenly watched. Chief Commissioner Monroe's very detailed seven-page report was sent to the Home Office. It was noted that it was believed that this new event had taken place on the first year anniversary of the murder of Annie Chapman. An excerpt from his report stated, 
This street is close to Burner Street, which was the scene of one of the previous Whitechapel murders, that of Elizabeth Stride. It is not a very narrow street, but is lonely at night, and is patrolled every half hour by a constable on beat. The arch where the body was found abuts on the pavement. The constable discovered the body somewhat after twenty minutes past five in the morning of Tuesday, 10th of September, 1889. He is positive that when he passed the spot at about five, the body was not there. It may therefore be assumed that the body was placed where it was found some time between 5 and 5.30 a.m. Although the body was placed in the arch on Tuesday morning, the murder, and although there is not yet before me proof of the cause of death, I assume that there has been a murder, was not committed there or near there. There was almost no blood in the arch, and the state of the body itself showed that death took place about 36 hours or more previously. This then enables me to say that the woman was made away with probably on Sunday night, the 8th of September. This was the date on which one of the previous Whitechapel murders, that of Annie Chapman, was committed. The obvious question on everyone's mind was, had the Ripper returned? In Chief Commissioner Monroe's view, no. Other than the corpse having been dismembered of the head and legs, there did not seem to be any other mutilation as had been so vividly enacted with the known Ripper murders. Chief Commissioner Monroe states in his report, there is no removal of any portion of the organs or intestines. The killing of the Pynchon Street victim may have been committed indoors, probably in the lodging of the murderer. Monroe went on to stress that there is no sign of frenzied mutilation of the body, as in the Mary Jane Kelly's case, which had also been committed indoors, but of a deliberate and skilful dismemberment with a view to removal. These are all a very striking departure from the practices of the Whitechapel murderer, and if the body had been found elsewhere other than that in Whitechapel, the supposition that death had been caused by the Ripper would probably not have been entertained. Eight days later, on the 16th of September, a parcel was found floating near Charing Cross. The grisly contents were believed to be associated with the headless woman's torso. From the South Wales Daily News, the 16th of September, 1889, the discovery of a blood-stained garment. What may prove an important discovery in connection with the recent murder in Whitechapel was made on Saturday night. Fireman Etherden was standing on a floating fire station off Charing Cross when he noticed something floating by. On reaching it, he found that it was a brown paper parcel which contained a chemise covered with blood. The parcel was handed over to the police at Scotland Yard. As the public and the police attempted to come to terms that it was possible there was now a second mad serial killer picking off women in the Whitechapel area, the newspapers wondered aloud if there was a murder gang roaming the streets. From the South Wales Daily News, 16th of September 1889, Is there a murder gang? Is there a murderous gang with headquarters in the East End or in some other part of London? This question, says the London Echo, is now exercising the minds of the authorities 
at Scotland Yard, as the police are almost satisfied that the latest crime was known to more than one man. Inspector Tonbridge and Inspector Swanson are pursuing their investigations, but at present it is stated there is but the smallest possible clue. The issue, however, has been somewhat narrowed. If the murder was the work of one man, his abode, the police ascertained, must be close to Pynchon Street. If the deed was not committed in Whitechapel, then the trunk could not have been conveyed so great a distance unless the miscreant had a vehicle at his disposal and the most exhaustive inquiries at cab yards of car men and at places where barrows are lent or hired have produced an absolutely negative result. Considerable efforts were made to attempt to identify the murdered woman. With the discovery of the blooded chemise believed to belong to the murdered woman, a few more clues could be gathered and gleaned. It was believed that the woman was of the poorer social class. The chemise had been mended but poorly. The chemise itself was of a cheaper material. A known prostitute was named as being the possible suspect, no doubt also fitting into the victim profile of the Ripper, but she was found safe and well, drying out in a lunatic asylum. Parents came forward of another missing girl, Emily Barker. However, upon reviewing the body, it was not believed to be her. The inquest run by Mr. Wynne E. Baxter, who had overseen the inquests of all of the Ripper murders, drew the conclusion that there had been a crime and that the victim was still unknown, as was the assailant. From the Eastern Post, the 28th of September, 1889, The Whitechapel Mystery, Inquest and Verdict Special Report, Willful Murder Against the Unknown. On Tuesday, at the Vestry Hall in Cable Street, St. George's in the East, Mr. Wynne E. Baxter resumed his inquiry into the circumstances attending the death of the woman whose mutilated remains were recently discovered in Pynchon Street, Backchurch Lane. Under the railway arch there, about eight foot from the road and about a foot in from the right wall of the arch, I saw the trunk of a woman minus the head and legs. The arms were not severed from the body and there was no pool of blood nor were there any signs of a struggle having taken place there. But on moving the body I found that there was a little blood underneath where the neck had been. This blood had apparently oozed out from the cut surface of the neck. On the remains were the remnants of what had been a chemise of common make. It had been torn down the front and cut from the front of the armholes on each side. There was no distinguishing mark on the garment. By all accounts, from the post-mortem of the body, the woman had been beaten terribly before the ordeal of being beheaded and partly dismembered. The body was taken to the mortuary and an examination there showed it to be that of a woman of stoutish build, of dark complexion and about five foot three inches in height and between thirty and forty years old. The body must have been dead about twenty-four hours. Besides the wounds caused by the severance of the head and legs, there was a wound fifteen inches long through the external coats of the abdomen. The body was not bloodstained, except where the chemise had rested upon it. The body seemed to have been recently washed. 
On the back were four bruises, all caused before death. One was under the spine on a level with the lower part of the shoulder blade. An inch lower down was a similar bruise. About the middle of the back also, over the spine, was a bruise about the size of half a crown. On a level with the top of the hip bone and three inches to the left of the spine was a bruise two inches in diameter, such as might be caused by a fall or a kick. None of the bruises were of old standing. On the right arm there were eight distinct bruises and seven on the left, all caused before death and of recent date. The backs of both forearms and hands were much bruised. On the outer side of the left forearm, about three inches above the waist, was a cut about two inches in length, and lower down was another cut, both caused after death. The bruises on the right arm were such as would have been caused by the arm having been tightly grasped. It was believed that the woman had died from loss of blood, but only so much could be hypothesized without the complete body. All of the medical staff within the inquest agreed upon the same conclusion. This murder was not reckoned to be made by the same person who had committed the Mary Kelly murder. They believed that the dismemberment had taken place in order to better conceal the identity of the victim and to avoid capture. The dismemberment of the torso had been deliberate and done with care, whereas the murder of Mary Kelly had been a frenzied attack. It was speculated that this was yet another torso in the series of torsos found in and around the Thames, as we covered in our episode of the Thames Torso Mystery. The Outcome Like the Ripper killings and two of the three of the Thames torsos found, no suspect was ever found for the Pinchin Street torso killing. Unlike two of the three bodies from the Thames torso killings, the identity of the victim was never discovered. The consensus was that this was another body in the series of slayings that had occurred slightly outside of Whitechapel with the torsos that had been found in and around the Thames. That would mean that there was a second serial killer roaming around the outskirts of Whitechapel simultaneously to the Ripper. In both cases, the serial slayer of women was never discovered. The investigation into the Pynchon Street torso murder proved to be challenging from the start. With the victim's identity unknown and her extremities missing, the police faced significant obstacles in gathering evidence and establishing leads. Despite their best efforts, no concrete breakthroughs were made, and the case eventually went cold. The Pynchon Street torso murder remains an enduring mystery in the annals of London's criminal history. The grisly nature of the crime, coupled with its proximity to the Jack the Ripper slayings, ensured its place in the collective memory of the city. To this day, the identity of the victim and the identity of her killer remains shrouded in darkness, leaving the Pynchon Street torso murder as a haunting reminder of the unresolved crimes that plagued the streets of London during the late 19th century. That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, the Pynchon Street torso mystery. We really hope you enjoyed the episode. We would like to thank our tremendous supportive subscribers. Thank you. Your comments, suggestions and interaction is greatly appreciated. Thank you again. If you haven't subscribed, we would be very grateful if you did.
We need a minimum of 1,000 subscribers to keep this channel alive. Please subscribe, tell your friends and share on social media. We would greatly appreciate it. We upload six days a week. Fridays are a new limited series called Forgotten Fridays, where we explore a snapshot from newspaper articles, advertisements and publications of a time from long ago. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in-depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrageous organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times, and I am Robin Coles.